Hey everyone, welcome back to the second sessions of introductions to color grading, hands on with Maxon. And can everyone uh, hear me just fine? I can hear you, man. Can you hear me just fine, Tony? I hear awesome. you just fine. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, um, I would like to welcome everyone. Thank you for showing up in the second sessions of Hands On with Maxon. And in today's sessions, we will talk more about a peek into a productions and we'll talk more about the image acquisitions. We'll focus our shift our attentions into the image acquiring acquisitions in this case. And um, yeah, we'll talk about things about choosing the correct format when you are thinking about shooting and you already thinking that you want to grade later on and what type of format that you need to consider. And we'll touch a little bit on codecs and also there's a um, topic that our guest speaker today, by the way, would like to cover. Um, it's talking about better pixel or bigger pixel. And we also see um, some um, tips and tricks from Tony about um, video compressions and how you can cheat video compressions. But let me introduce you to our guest speaker today. And our guest speaker today is Anthony Bari. Anthony is a filmmaker and editor based in Los Angeles. Tony, can you tell, tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I kind of use the filmmaker term loosely. <laughs> um, like film is my art. It's fun. I love it. Um, and when I say film, everything is digital now. Uh, I'm not on a film budget. Uh, but I would say, um, you know, I'm kind of a, a tech coach at times, tell people how, where they can save money, how they can save money, um, where you can do better and where the weakness is, uh, you know, in the production or even on the post side. So I kind of cover the full gamut of things uh, from technical to creative. And of course the two work side by side. You can't do a uh, great creative without having good technical and you can't do good technical without a good creative mind. Um, or it could be just too technical and boring. So anyway, I won't bore you with that. I'm based in Los Angeles and uh, yeah. Let's let's get right into it, and then I think uh, you'll understand a little bit more. So, Max, if you can give me the uh, option to share my screen, I think you can um, share a screen. But uh, let me walk through the, the uh, let me break down the sessions, um, right, sure. the structure of the sessions first. Um, today's sessions it, it's a two-hour sessions, and in the first half of the sessions, Tony will explain you about the image acquisitions process. And he'll share some experience based on his uh, personal experience. And in the second half of the sessions, I will try to cover some topics about node orders in Resolve. How will you uh, tackle the order of processing in Resolve? And we will also look into the Magic Bullet Suites plugin because there are some tools that normally misunderstood. And these tools are also have order of processing as well. And we'll look into that. And the bigger chunk of the se of my sessions, we will look into the process of noise reductions. And if we have enough time, we'll touch on the, on the topic of LUT a little bit. But if not, then maybe next time. All right. And um, just uh, usual housekeeping. You, you can follow along these sessions and to access the downloadable material, um, you can simply go to the event page and visit the, uh, the introductions to color grading uh, page and follow the link, which will lead you into Dropbox. And there you can download all the hands out and the footage and also the timeline. Um, for today's, um, there's not so much um, footage that we can share, but there is a white paper that Tony kind of uh, provide us. Uh, it's a great white paper from Apple to understand the, the normal codec that you're using. So uh, if you want to understand more about uh, ProRes 422, ProRes 444, 420, or 411, this is the white paper that you want to um, probably read. And also, if you miss last webinar and you want to uh, watch the recordings or any any uh, webinar recordings, you can visit our um, 
training team um, YouTube channel. It's called Maxon Training Team. And uh, you can uh, browse the webinar based on the playlist and follow along with a provided um, file as well. And don't forget that today you can also get a free t-shirt. And that is by following the, the link that you see. Yes, Tony? I was just saying, don't forget the free t-shirt, yeah. Yeah, free t-shirt. And you can follow the links uh, provided in the download uh, links. I will uh, repost the PDF document in the chat as well. And you can follow the link and use the uh, code 08 titles to get the t-shirt. And by using the codes, you don't have to pay for the t-shirt, but you just need to pay for the shipping cost, which is around about for a dollar. And yeah, if you would like to test your uh, test your knowledge, you can uh, you, uh, use the certifications page to try uh, to refresh your memory. And you can take like 50 um, questions, 50 randomly selected questions. And, um, and in the end, uh, upon passing, you will get a certificate for uh, of acknowledgements for passing this um, elementary knowledge test. So for example, if you're using Magic Bullet Suite and you want to refresh your um, knowledge, you can follow the link and do the elementary knowledge test. And to check the further uh, upcoming events, uh, feel free to check maxon.net slash events. And all right, without further ado, let us uh, jump in into our discussions. And in today's discussions, Tony will bring us to, um, will we'll share us his, his knowledge about um, image acquisitions. So Tony, the floor is yours. All right, do you hear me okay? I think I had a bandwidth issue here. No, we can hear you just fine. Sounds great. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. And mm -hmm. let's see. Uh, here we go. I think I think you need to make me presenter. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let's see. This is what we'll talk about today. Um, you know, topics covered here, 709 versus log, goes straight into why you shoot raw, and then, uh, you know, bigger pixel versus better pixel, uh, why you use that, and just different ways that you can uh, cheat, all right? So I'm talking about uh, kind of cheating on your memory card, all right? So uh, when, you, when you have, you know, 128 gigs, or you have a 64 card, or something like that um you know you need to conserve your memory and uh compression could be your best friend and it could be your worst enemy so we'll talk about some situations where you want to dial things back and um you know with interviews nothing is is more fun than watching one hour of a program where 45 minutes is a talking head so i'm saying that sarcastically so uh you know there's ways that you can cheat especially if uh you know you have all this artistic b-roll and stuff you can showcase and show off um the best thing is that you can uh utilize moments and uh capture higher resolution and then shrink it down so we'll talk about that and then um you know that's our better pixel versus our uh bigger pixel so uh let me just jump right in and we're going to talk first about 709 versus log let me give you a very practical example first um just go right here on my camera here and this is log, right? And you can see that there's a little bit more uh, dynamic here. You can see it's pretty milky and washed out. And then boom, here we go. Contrast, sweetness, in uh, saturation, right? Saturation is kind of like sugar. So we'll we'll talk about that in just a moment. But here's my log, and here is my 709. So let me get out of this mode here. Let me just step through here and show you so first i'm going to just go into this bin here all right we have this shot all right and i and i duplicated that same shot and actually let me mute this so i duplicated that same shot 
So this right here is my log version of this shot. And this is my 709 version. Okay, now you'll notice, right? Basically, if we look at it, it's like you have a lower ceiling, okay? So um, all your colors, right? You don't have that much more space to work with, but when you're in log, you have a way higher ceiling and you can capture things and you can isolate things a little bit better. So um, it's not a bad idea when you're shooting, depending on the camera that you're shooting with, or if you have an external recorder, uh, like a Blackmagic device, the Blackmagic Video Assist, or um, I think the Shogun uh, Inferno, either one of those Shogun, uh, I mean, they call the um, Ad Atomos, Atomos Ninja, right? This, there's a few of them on the market and uh, they will allow you to capture either a flattened image or a 709 image, which basically everything is already in place. So, uh, you know, if you want to toggle back and forth, you know, it's not a bad idea when you are shooting uh, something and you, even if you want to capture it in, in, um, in 709, I mean, if you want to capture it in log to expose for 709, so you don't blow things out and you don't need uh, to do a full color overhaul of your raw just to get to a good spot. So like when you are exposing and you expose to something like, you know, like right here, right? You have a little bit more leeway and you don't have that same bias that you would use unless you were, if you're working in here. And if you see that some of the light right here is kind of blowing out, but over here you can still see some detail. So the main reason um, you want to pay attention to 709 is also I've seen, you know, just from personal experience, you might have this beautiful cinema camera and then, uh, you know, the, the person you're working for needs, has a quick turnaround and they just want it to be 709 and they just want you to point the camera, get the stuff and, and give it to them and it's going right up on the internet or it's going straight to broadcast. And that's pretty common. So uh, 709, it's not always, um, it's, it's a way to get things fast and you know what you're getting. With, with log, you actually have such a dynamic, dependent, especially depending on your camera, you have uh, the full potential of all those colors. So every color is kind of a reference of a color. So it's not the full blue, it's not the full orange, right? Uh, but it's just a hint of it so you can bring it up. So when you do add saturation to your image, you don't, uh, you add a little bit of saturation to, uh, you know, to a 709 image and you might end up with something that looks almost fake and almost um, like a cartoon. So that's where you might see uh, colors just start to bleed and shift from one to the other, one uh, area to the other. So it's not a great thing. So. Um, right now, I'm, I'm displayed in 709, <laughs> uh, but let me just show you here in my timeline. Now, uh, another thing is, and I'm in DaVinci Resolve. Uh, right now, I'm in the studio version, but the free version is about 80% of the program. So I highly encourage you, download it and get familiar um, if you haven't already with Max for the last you know week or so. So inside of here, uh, this, is, this is an image that I shot, which is... Uh, a Blackmagic RAW image, and it is a dot B RAW, right? Blackmagic RAW. And this right here is uh, 4096 by 2160, which is DCI full 4K versus UHD 38, uh, 3840 by 2160. Uh, slightly different, this much more pixels, uh, but my point being inside of here, there's a few things that you can do. So let's just, I'm gonna quickly also talk about RAW, right? And why you would shoot RAW. And um, let me just tip a hat to the fact that the Blackmagic, uh, Blackmagic RAW is really uh, lightweight, easy to use. And um, I'll see if I can share a document on that, or even we can go on Blackmagic's website at some point, I'll show you. Uh, they have quite a bit of options for compression, which we'll talk about a little later. So inside of here, I'm gonna just right click and I'm gonna show you, we can go and we can choose um, to make this, I'll go to Blackmagic Design and I'm gonna convert this over to a 
709. And there's a few versions of this, uh, but I'll go to the latest version, right? So uh, Black Magic 4K film, oop, that auto auto save screwed me up. So LUT, Black Magic Design, right? Uh, Black Magic 4K film, Rec 709, that's our 709, all right? To uh, version uh, three. So when I do that, that changes the way this image looks, okay? So before it was a little bit more washed out, but now you can actually see some color, you see some saturation, and like even in the little dust areas there, you can you can pick up all the little dust areas with the contrast, right? So it's great for contrast, and like I said, you can notice a lot of the detail in the shot because now we have uh, contrast let me just take this back. And this is where we were originally, which is not bad, but um, it's slightly different as far as how much room do we have to do any color grading. So um, let me just show you kind of what, what the benefit is, right, uh, of the RAW itself. And there's many flavors of RAW. I mean, you even have RAW in a DSLR camera nowadays, right? So I'll go here to the inspector and I'm going to go to uh, the image and i'm going to do this is uh i'm going to just use the decoding options right so with the decoding options there's a few things that you can do and it just makes this clip that much more malleable okay so think about raw as like this lump of clay that you could kind of really mold and turn into something really nice or either that or um you know if it was 709 it's just a little bit more dry and you you can work with a little bit before it's it's done so um the idea here is this is like let's consider this like a full sensor print like you have the usability you have all the the options that you had when you were in um when you were in the uh in the camera right but a few things uh pertain to like this one here in particular i cannot uh, change my ISO below 1250 because there's a dual ISO setting. So the sensitivity of of the camera itself was set to the higher tier. So I can start at 1250 and go up. But if I shot something that was a little bit lower, that like 800, right, then I'd be going up to uh, 1000 or up to 1250. So right now I'm in the higher tier because that's where the way I shot it in 16. So I can go down to 1250, but uh, I can go higher if needed. Now, the the other benefit is I can go in here and I can actually adjust the colors. So this is pre, uh, you know, doing any work, any post-production work. This is literally, you can do this at the asset level. So this means that like I can adjust it and adjust the exposure of my image, right? This is one of the true benefits of RAW. So if you don't have, uh, if you didn't shoot raw and you try to ex adjust this exposure, it's this right here, if you look, it's actually doing this incrementally. And let me see if I can pull up, um, I'll go into here. Let's, get, let's just get a little nerdy. <laughs> let's see if I can pull up uh, my video scopes, all right? So here's my video scopes and I can pull this up and just show you that we're retaining things without really clipping them. See that? Now, if I were to do this with a 709 image, like let me change this right here to just 709, uh, and I'll even do the color color space in 709. All right. So now, when we start to do that, you can see I have a little less room before I hit my head over here. See? So basically the amount of room that you have in your image right, before it starts to do this, all this lovely clipping. See, when, uh, when you start to clip here, you're losing information here. It's just like in the morning, if, if you like to have toast and jam, right? If you put that toaster setting on high and you, know, you went to take a phone call, come back, and now you have burnt toast. Uh, you can scrape that away, but it's still gonna taste like burnt toast. So, you know, loss of data here, when you blow something out like that, you wanna retain those highlights. Here's another thing, in RAW, you have this uh, highlight recovery, which is gonna do a little bit better and kind of give you a little bit of a buffer 
right, on those highlights so you don't clip them. So uh, in here, you know, as I'm doing this, now I'm pumping this up and it's still trying to retain that highlight information. But if I were to go here and let me just change my gamma here. And my color space is at uh, 709. So we still have, we have some room here, but keep in mind, um, gamma, right, versus color space, two, two, two things that work in parallel, but let me just show you here. If I set this to 709 and this to 709, this is kind of like the realistic situation, right? Um, and then also, if you're a fan of LUTs, if you know about them already, if you see them on the internet, if you think they are the catch-all, uh, you know, I'll just put a lot on it and it works. Uh, you'll make you you'll make a lot of enemies in post. But uh, what I would say to that is, ideal situation is if you can shoot raw, right? Or even if you just shoot log. Now, if the difference is raw is a heavier file that has options that you can do all these fine adjustments in, like adjusting the exposure, right? And then um, you know, kind of working with uh resetting things and you have all that all the control that you had in camera you now have uh on the back end in post which is magical okay so a lot of these cameras like the sony cameras or the uh the red camera especially uh black magic cameras uh they all have this raw setting canon has a raw setting they all have their different flavor of that and that's a direct sense of print so you might not see all right, you might not see these exact same options. They, they'll be called something else. But the good part about that is they're all, uh, all flavors of raw will give you that option, all right? So you can adjust exposure. So you can adjust, um, you know, the overall ISO, all right? So you can kind of lower the ceiling a little bit, all right? Maybe you shot uh, at nighttime and you needed to brighten things up. You can punch up that sensitivity, okay? So having the raw situation, let me just take this back. Uh, here's another beautiful thing. The way that you well, shot it, the way that you intended, yes. A small interruption though. Do you prefer to take questions while you're going or do you prefer to take questions later I, on in the- I can, I can do both. I can actually, I'll take a question and then I can, uh, I can uh, if I'm gonna cover it, then I'll, then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll move on, but I'll, I'll make sure we come back to it, so. Awesome. Because there's a questions that probably uh, you can uh, answer it while you're talking about raw. Carolyn is asking, could you um, explain uh, what is the main difference between a log file and raw file? Okay, and, so, yeah. And, and after that, there's also another question that probably you can also tackle. Um, Arjun is asking, does Apple Pro raw, Apple raw, uh, Apple, Apple Pro Res raw, I guess, right? Yeah, does Apple ProRes Roll work in Resolve um, for 709? It's a great question. So as of right now, to my knowledge, unless the, unless uh, in 17.2.2, um, not as of now. Um, that's definitely a huge topic of dis discussion. So uh, my answer is no, it does not yet. It works in um, it works in Final Cut. 10 and it works in, I think it works in Premiere now. I'm not 100% sure, but um, yeah, I, I want to say there's a, there's a lot of discussion around that topic. So, um, but to my knowledge in Resolve, no, it does not. Um, but, and, and and that's near and dear to me because I have Sony camera and I have a Atomos uh, Shogun and it shoots raw natively to the Shogun but I really can't use the raw functions without transcoding them if I wanted to stay inside of DaVinci Resolve. So that's question two. Question one, uh, the raw versus the log. You can't have, <laughs> well, you're always shooting log when you shoot raw. You can, uh, you can use a LUT, you can use anything. The, ben the benefit of shooting raw is that, um, is that you're, always shooting log, but you can actually toggle on, toggle on and off like this. You can toggle on and off your uh, 709 and your log. Let's leave this in log for a little bit. I kind of like the log situation, but um, you have that option. And even if you were to bake it in, 
right? Which means you're recording with it. It becomes an option in post that you can turn off. So if you don't like the, let's say, and this is uh, just to kind of, you know, talk about the, uh, the LUT thing again, you know, LUTs are not the end all be all because some LUTs will literally, depending on where you point your camera, you have to re-expose and you have to change things. And um, they're not good for every scene and they're not consistent uh, the whole way around. But you can have a LUT for 709, kind of like I have here, um, which puts you in a good average, but a LUT is a good average, but some of them, especially the stylistic ones that you might just download online, you know, cinematic LUTs or, you know, amazing Hollywood LUTs or whatever, Google it and you'll find it. But um, the idea is when you shoot raw, you always have log. And the benefit to that is that you, you have uh, a toggle, an option to turn on a LUT or not. You have 709 instantly if you want it, or you can take it away and just see things flat and build them up yourself. Um, but if you shot 709, if you shoot with a LUT, or um, what do you call, if you shot, um, sorry, if you were to shoot non-RAW, compressed, regular like H.264, H.265, stuff that like a drone shoots, a GoPro shoots, um, even DSLRs, if you were to pick just the basic .mov, not a raw file, uh, when you shoot 709, you have 709. You can't go back and forth. You're baked in. It's a baked in file. But if on, on the other side of that, if you were to, um, if you were to shoot log as an H.264 on your drone, on your GoPro, on your other consumer camera, on your phone. There are, there are apps that allow you to do a flattened log or um, I think Filmic Pro, I wanna say is a big one for the iPhone. And um, you know, there's, so, there's so many different ones for the Android, iPhone, you know, mobile, mobile device market. Um, so you, you have the option there, but just know that when you're shooting something that's not raw, it's, it's baked in and what you see is what you get. Raw, you have the option to turn things on and off. So I hope that answers that question. I think that might've been a little long-winded, but um, let me just move forward a little bit here. And like I said, I you, no problem. Just to, just to show you kind of where, where you hit your head with exposure. Um, and then let's kind of jump ahead here because um, I think we're about halfway through my part of this session. So let's just go back and revisit um, this here, right? So some of the other topics, right? So we kind of dance between 709 and log and, and raw, right? So just so you know, you cannot, you cannot have, uh, well, you can, but it's not an absolute thing. Log is synonymous with raw, right? So log is synonymous with raw, meaning you're always going to have log, right? capability in raw majority of the time. So when you are shooting, you are getting the full dynamic of your camera in raw. You're getting access to uh, post exposure, right? And if you were just to turn up uh, exposure in post, you will quickly notice that you start burning away information and things just turn into burnt toast really quick, right? So. Uh, and then in 709, if you were to do that, right, you'll 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 quickly realize like that as soon as you start adjusting the idea of exposure or just brightening your image, you will start to lose data. So um, raw is is the way if you have the memory card space, right? Uh, if your camera has the capability of shooting to a a uh, cheaper medium such as an SD card, right? Or if you have to have, you know, these crazy, uh, I have them all over the place, but of course I don't have them right here at my desk at this very moment, but actually here, like the Sony shoots this proprietary, almost SD card looking thing. That's the uh, Express Card Type A, right? Which you can only find a Sony uh, version of, which, costs a pretty penny, about $160 for 80 gigs versus, uh, you know, 
other options like an SD card, you can shoot on the Black Magic camera for uh, you know a fraction of the cost. So that's something to look at when you do buy your camera is what is the shoot shooting media uh, medium, and uh, you know can you just order it on Amazon or do you have to go to your you know your specialized camera shop? So if you're like me and you go to a different country and you're way in the middle of nowhere and your card went bad and you still want to shoot raw, do you have, can you go to just, you know, any camera shop and buy, buy the best SD card or you can't do it and it's a special order thing and there goes your raw. So um, that's my, that's my rant on uh, <laughs> camera, camera mediums and uh, you know, what you can use to shoot. So let's just talk about better pixel versus uh, a bigger pixel versus better pixel. So I have this stuff here and I'll and I'll show you and I'll talk about it here in just a moment. Let's just kind of get rid of this so we can see more of this. So I'm gonna just play this for you and just show you these little tiny bees. Let's actually, I wanna show you this. So this is the size of these bees. They're tiny, they look like flies. They're not normal bees. These are like uh, stingless, st uh, stingless, Asian stingless bees, and they make their own little honey, which is pretty medicinal and and does not taste like your re regular honey. You put it on toast, and you're kind of like it tastes like a cough drop or something. So it's not well, not a cough drop, maybe like a Ricola or something. But um, you know, this right here, uh, are they're tiny? They're the size of a fingernail, so they're not the normal uh, size, and they're super fast. And um, basically, my point is, even with a, uh, that's a spoon, <laughs> regular size spoon, not a giant spoon, okay? Just a regular size spoon. And this is how big these, uh, these stingless honeybees are uh, in relative to that spoon. And also these little, um, these little like, they look like little clay pots where they, they store their honey. So they have this really interesting looking uh, hive which is actually in a spiral. And I don't know if you can see it with the footage I have today, but uh, they're very unique and they're very tiny. And I wanted to capture them in macro uh, in the best possible way, but I had to do a dance between resolution um, and, uh, and speed. So let's talk about compression, speed. Um, I'll talk to you about the macro capabilities. I mean, why I would do this in a macro situation. Uh, and then I'll talk to you about interviews. So this is ways to, cheat using compression and yes you can still shoot raw and raw has its own compression so even though it says raw doesn't mean it's not compressed you can pick a flavor of raw right and you can shoot a lighter version of raw but it just doesn't look as good or consistent as the highest most dense version which you shoot one clip and your memory card is done so if you want to you do have that option so um, let's just go here and let me show you. So again, this is how fast they're moving. All right? And this is the ideal situation. This is kind of what I wanted to get. All right? And again, they're moving pretty fast. And it's really hard to keep things that small in focus in a macro situation. Uh, and number one, I'm using a, a flashlight. Uh, not a flashlight, just a little, like one of these portable LEDs like an aperture light. So this is one of three different ones that I have, um, but you know, just the right amount of light. And then also if you're doing this with, with, with these bees, you don't want to startle them. You want, you want them to think that it's the sun, right? There's a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting uh, things to, to when dealing with mother nature. So uh, I default to the scientist types that I, that I work with. So uh, in here, Here's kind of an ideal situation, right? They're playing back. They're a little bit, uh, they're, they're slower. They're slower also because my computer uh, is not playing back the same. Let me do this. Hopefully now I can, yeah, there we go. Get a little bit of playback. So anyway, it's not liking this because I'm broadcasting uh, and I'm showing you this. Let me see if I can drop it to a quarter. So this right here is kind of what I'm going for is at least this feels a little bit smooth, right? Um, and basically for this, 
All right, this one right here, let's just let's just pull this up. And this one right here is in 1920 by 1080, okay? But I'm in 4K. So um, you can actually shoot this and size it up. And when you're looking at something like macro, you might, uh, you know, this right here is a situation when you're not getting the better pixel, right? You're kind of just, you're, you're, I'm trying to get a slower, smoother frame rate. Right, so a lot of people will actually shoot just up to 60 and then try to slow that down. There are different uh, apps. I mean, apps. There are different plugins that allow you to do that, um, and then built-in things in the application, such as Optical Flow, right, um, which has been around for quite some time, where it will actually calculate and recalculate frames, and it'll ask you to render, and it actually leans on your computer to do a lot of the heavy lifting, but it'll add frames in and it, it calculates for you. And then there's also like the nearest neighbor option, which tries to do something for you, but it's very obvious. So I don't know if you realize uh, there's a huge difference, right? And when you truly shoot a higher frame rate or when you just try to mock it up in post. And even if you shot 60 and you try to make it look like 120 in post, I can spot that a mile away. A lot of people can. There's programs like Twixter. Twixter is another plugin that you can use that like just uh, really kind of does a lot of the heavy lifting, but it's not perfect. So if you have detail, your detail can go away pretty fast. Um, but it really works well for stuff with like just a very simple sky and a simple background and simple shapes. But when you get into something like you know, depending on how close you are on one of these bees. You see their eyeballs and antennas and, you know, their many eyes, you know, and the tiny wings and texture like that. You could lose that when doing something like Twixter. So what I'm trying to show you is I have shots that are like, these are the 4K shots. And let me show you the 4K shots that were like, this is the bees coming out of their hive in 60 frames a second. And they're tiny, like I showed you, same bees, right, coming out of the hive and in 60 frames a second. Now, all these yellow clips down here, these are in 1080, but these are at 120 frames per second. And this is kind of like, again, you can kind of cut back and forth. And, you know, even here, it's so hard to get these bees. Like, so if I capture just a glimpse of this bee, you know, in, uh, you know, in high speed, now I've got a full second, a full second cutaway, right? So like, again, here, just to show you just how fast these things are, and then here. So, you know, the ideal situation, and yes, I got this in RAW as well. So, you know, you have this, you can play it back at a normal speed if you want, but now you have access to all those frames and, uh, you know, something so tiny that just kind of, runs across the screen you can't really express you know kind of detail and you can't really show anybody anything about these bees unless you have the proper frame rate so they're actually really fast uh but i i'm shooting in 120 at 1080 and it's being sized up so it's not uh you know you still get some pretty good detail there but you know for a cutaway so again 60 is good in one example right at 4k and this is kind of where you do that dance between like quality and, and, and quantity of frames, right? So, um, you know, like I said before is the, the ideal situation would be that I have a, you know, now I do, now I have a camera that shoots uh, 4K 120. But when you don't have that, you want to be able to bend and shift. So I went and I switched to 1080. Some cameras will actually do this punch in and they only give you a certain part of the sensor, which is which is interesting as well. So um, you know, with that said, you can uh, you know you can go and uh, you can, uh, some will actually allow you to shift and still have the full majority of your sensor. Others will literally give you the center punch and say, "Here's your 1080 from your 4K." So just a warning when you do uh, kind of downshift and res to grab those frames. Uh, a lot. I know uh, on even on the older Sony cameras, when you change your frame your frame size to shoot slow motion, 
you are getting a slightly cropped image. So keep that in mind. But if in this sense, cropped is your best friend because now I'm literally in and now I'm closer in. <laughs> so for macro, it's great. But uh, when you're shooting other things, you just need to understand that you might need to reframe uh, your image. So again, you know, this kind of stuff, cheating on your compression, right? And just kind of, um, you know, working working within the bounds of the bounds that you have, um, whether it's, you know, did you spend the money on the SD card or, you know, on the camera that lets you use the SD card? Did you spend the money on, uh, you know, the macro lens, right? So there's so many different things, but all I was saying is, if you can do a dance between the frame size, the compression, and uh, you know that way you can save, uh, you know, save the day and just get those quick glimpses. So you get these like quick one second shots that were like tack sharp, and then move on, and then go back to the wider shots uh, that are shot in 4K. So you can always cheat and do the dance. And I just want to uh, debunk this one myth for you, like. When you watch a lot of these uh, shows, especially shows with archival footage, right? Anything that shows you a flashback from the past, documentary-wise, right? You probably can see the obvious ones, but there's a lot of them that, um, you know, maybe they came from the early 2000s before 4K was really a thing. And, uh, you know, they shot interviews in 1080. And, uh, and then they put them in a 4K program. So when you go on Hulu, not Hulu, uh, in Netflix, and you watch something in 4K, it was mastered in 4K. A lot of that stuff is sized up, sized up to be 4K, whether it's the computer doing it or whether they, you know, um, you know, it's, it's, well, it's always the computer doing it. So, um, but a lot of the times it's all done in post and especially crime shows and especially uh, documentary where you flashing back to the past, especially when 4K wasn't even around. Okay, so it's pretty common practice and it's a great way to cheat and uh, not everybody is going to tell. So if you want to get on like- On the note of upscaling, Tony, sorry to interrupt you. On the sure. note of up upscaling, um, Greg has a nice, nice questions here. Um, Greg is asking, what is your approach when you are doing upscaling, for example, from 1080 to 2060? Um, do you recommend using Red Giant Instant 4K, for example? Or is there any approach? There's so many flavors of that now. Um, I think when, when Instant 4K came out, it was one of only a few. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tip a hat to the Red Giant stuff, but I will also say that, you know, there's also the native options. Uh, it's instant HD is native in After Effects, um, and so is uh, inside of Resolve. You have a super scale option. You also have uh, inside of Premiere or uh, any NLE right now, I want to say, and I think in Avid it might be an extra switch or two or three or four. <laughs> uh, but if you do it inside of Resolve, if you do it inside of Premiere, if you do it inside of Final Cut 10, um, when there is a scaling option, usually as a preference, that says match uh, match to uh, sequence size, and it does the math for you, so you don't have to do 120 scale. It just does the math for you as soon as it hits the timeline. So like on here, you can go and like, let me just go to video and here's an option and I turned on fill. But if I went to project settings, you'll see like you have an option like this. And basically because my timeline, I have my timeline here in, in uh, 2K DCI, right? But this is, this is 1920, not the 2048. So this is for 2K, the other one is 1080, which is not far off. Look at how many pixels I'm missing. So the scaling option is here, right? So if I were to change this whole timeline, let me just show you, and I'll, and I'll move on to the interview uh, situation. So I'm gonna change this here to uh, 4K DCI, just to show you how fast it is in most programs, most NLEs nowadays. I'm gonna switch this to 4K DCI, which is the same flavor as that 2K DCI, and you'll see nothing changed. It instantly scaled it up. Uh, we didn't have, if it didn't change, that'd be sitting in the box in the middle. You'd see a lot of this background, that black background would be all over it. But now let me change and I'll just change this to fill. 
Now that 1080 is now filling the frame. And if you look at it, and let's put this in full screen here. It's a little fuzzy, but that is, you can totally get away with that. Like you can still see areas where it's sharp. And I'm telling you, majority of things you watch on, on online or TV or streaming, whatever you want to say, whatever you want to call it, they all do this. This is very common practice. Okay. So most people have no idea because it just says mastered in 4K and all the marketing makes it sound amazing. So, um, but instant 4K gives you a really good interface, but um, I don't want to tell you that you can't do it natively. So I happen to do it natively. I used to use those plugins to do it, but now I just do it natively. So scaling options inside of Resolve, you can do it. And you can also do it here at the asset level, which is a little bit stronger, but it requires some rendering and it'll give you some playback. So right click, clip attributes. You can do this to a hundred clips at a time and do this uh, super scaling. So under the clip attributes, video, super scale, two times, three times, and four times. My definitions of these would be when you do two times, it's for standard def to go to HD. When you do three times, it's for HD to go to 4K, right? This is my opinion. This is not the, the rule book here. Um, this is not 100% a fact, but this is kind of how I use it. And I've used this quite a bit when I have to size up if I'm finishing a program uh, for, you know, for broadcast or anything. So, um, and then four times as if you're trying to go beyond, if I was trying to take a 4K shot and make it look like an 8K shot, we're not an 8K yet. I don't care what anybody says, no 8K, no 12K. Maybe it's, it's, it's being shot like that, but we're still, everybody is finishing in 4K uh, or they're still mastering in uh, 1080. And when you watch uh, sports, a lot of sports is 720 sized. It might be shot in, uh, you know, in 8K on a red, raw, whatever, uh, but it's it's being sent to you on a stream that's 720 a lot of the times, or that weird like 1440, but a lot of TV, a lot of programs are are still HD being sized up. So sorry to ruin it for you. But Super Scale is native. Uh, inside of Premiere, you have options. Inside of Final Cut, you have options. And scaling is kind of a big thing. So um, I feel like that's a great question. I hope that answered that question. Well, thank you very much. That's a great answer over there, Tony. So, um, if, if you don't mind, uh, would you mind to answer one more question on um, frame rate? Yep. Um, Jesus from Spain is asking, is there any uh, major difference when you are using uh, 24 frame per second compared to 23.976? Uh, there is. Uh, the sound will drift. Never mixed, uh, you know, never mix the two. Uh, like you're, you will drift literally like a fraction of a, like of a frame, you know, every now and then, and it creates sound issues. So, um, if you do true 24, I like to call it true 24 when you work in that also, I'm going to say my experience has been that certain programs, um, uh, like for instance, if you have the new Mac mini that has the M1 chip and you try to use DaVinci Resolve. Uh, you know, later version of DaVinci Resolve, and you're playing back a true 24 timeline, which means there is a difference right here, okay? That is true 24. Most things are 2398. This is to emulate film, but this is to emulate film. This is a lot more friendly than this. When you do this, if you do not tell people from the beginning that you are shooting 24 frames, true 24, meaning 24 frames flat. So think about it. If you have to explain it that many times uh, down the line, so you you shoot it and you have to tell the sound person. Then you have to tell the people in post. Then you have to tell. Then you have to make sure you're always shooting it. And then if you have multiple cameras, you have to tell all of them. So without having all that explanation, if you say we're shooting 2398, that's an easy fix. Everybody knows what that is. If you say 24, some people will choose 2398 
or some cameras will actually shoot and i think that's been fixed by now but some cameras actually shoot when they say 24 they're shooting 2398 some cameras even when they're shooting uh see here there's 2997 and there's 30 so there's still a difference if you want the easy button if you don't want a headache if you don't want to run into mistakes shoot 2398 if you if you feel like you're a great communicator then shoot 24 that's my explanation i hope that makes sense thank you tony yep so um let's just talk quickly and i want to use this as an example here so when i was talking about log and i'm just going to kind of give you a visual here we're talking about log right and we're talking about you know shooting stuff and and the color let's just compare this to coffee right it's morning for me i love coffee I hope a lot of you like coffee if not we can compare it to lemonade right but um you have a lot of potential to make things either too sour too sweet too creamy whatever the case may be and now actually people are adding cream to lemonade too so you know we could we can do a direct relation so um you know here's your your basic coffee right your your espresso shot and then you know you can have your coffee on ice right and then uh you know kind of here here uh i don't know why it's playing that hold on one second there it is and then here you know when you add a little bit of cream to your coffee let's say that coffee is our image right and like with this you know the ideal situation is like how much cream do you ever like you go and you take somebody's coffee order right you go take somebody's coffee order and they're like yeah yeah cream on the side right why uh if you treat an image the way you you treat coffee or the way you would order a coffee for someone else if you're shooting for an audience right give them the cream on the side let them add the sugar packets right like uh if you're doing this with somebody who's a colorist if you have that if you have uh you know a post team that's separate from yourself give them the option have the cream on the side right have the sugar on the side because if you make something too creamy if you make something too sugary now it's lost only thing you can do is water it down and that's going to make for a recipe for disaster nobody wants watered down coffee nobody wants <laughs> uh something too flat and uh, i think you know for me i like to compare everything to coffee i guess or pizza. Uh, that, that's a great analogy <laughs> because today this morning i just had my coffee which is like a new shop and it was too sweet and i really don't like it all right back what to your you presentation sorry yeah, no what can you do with it at that point you can add more coffee now you're just gonna have a bigger coffee that's still i can add more, more coffee and but i need to pay more right so yeah <laughs> i dealt with it or, or, or <laughs> maybe they put coffee in there a lot of coffee in there already and then you just got the you know, start getting jittery and shaking. So exactly. Anyway, that's my example of how you flavor your image and how you shoot your image, how you capture your image. Um, if you have the option, just put the cream and the sugar on the side. That's that's my takeaway. Um, so now let me show you another thing here. Let's just talk quickly about uh, because I think we got a few minutes here, and uh, and I and and I want uh, and, and uh, will Max Max will. Uh, We'll talk about a few things and then I'm going to hop off. So um, when you have these wonderful artistic shots, I'm not calling myself wonderful or stuff I shoot wonderful. I'm just saying in general, you want to shoot the stuff that you want to shoot, but then you also need to capture all the, all the necessary stuff to get the facts, to get the interviews, to get those sound bites, right? So I'm going to use these examples as kind of comfort over visual. This is just a comfortable interview, right? And these are just kind of like the little sound bites because you know what? Um, you get somebody more comfortable, they're going to talk to you more comfortable, right? You, you make their environment more friendly, right? Instead of you just trying to be so artistic and get, get the birds to fly over at the perfect moment and get the sky to look perfect, you know, let's say you have two hour block to get all this wonderful stuff at magic hour right and depending on where you live that might not be a two hour block that might be a one hour block because depending on what side of the world you're on that sun is beautiful and then it just drops quick 
and then it's gone. So, you know, the ideal situation is you do this and you keep the timing in mind. So you get those beauty shots and you really work around the lighting you have. And you know what? I could shoot this at nighttime, right? Do I need the camera? Maybe for some shots. Maybe I get one or two beautiful stage shots, get those interview clips, right? And you get the things that you want out of the person, but get the comfortable stuff, right? So for me, I would shoot this in 1080. I would get the best uh, bits that are like all the like stuff that you would put into a tease, a trailer or something. Get those like poster frame shots. Get those uh, shots that you know you want to show when somebody's talking about a controversial topic or they're introducing themselves. You want to sandwich it with all this but if you know you're shooting like okay i have this 64 gig uh you know sd card and i need to get all this stuff and i know this person has a lot of stuff to share i'm just gonna shoot a lower bit rate maybe i can still shoot raw like i shot these in raw but i don't have to shoot them in 4k i can shoot these in 1080 right so it's kind of you know like i said watching uh, any of these shows where they have interviews, they dance between B-roll and interview, B-roll and interview, right? All the good ones do, you know? And I love PBS, but there's still a lot of old programs, um, you know, where they just sit and, and let you watch somebody talk like this, up close and personal for 30 minutes. And it's this person talking here, then it's this person talking here, then it's this person talking here, and uh, it's not as fun as if you get visual representation behind it. So, you know, you know, again, here's another one. There's another, not that this is a bad shot, but this is not my best. And this is just like, you know what? I'm going to get this person right there where they're comfortable. We are already having a conversation. And, uh, you know, it's not that great outside. It's really gray and overcast, but this is when we have time. And that is documentary in a nutshell. When you have time, do not waste an uh, an optimal moment and when you have time you use that time to uh to get that good sound bite. so the idea is you have this but then right let me see if i have this other should have this other here i have another timeline here and i'll just show you you know this is when you can do you know you have these other things let me just go here and you know, they're talking, you got all the good sound bites, but they're talking over other, uh, you know, footage. And you, and again, this stuff isn't flavored yet. I'm just kind of showing you what you can be doing, right? And you know, if you save space on your memory card, you know, save space on your memory card so you can use it later. And I'm still at quarter res. So let me just turn that off and for this, it should be fine. Let me also turn off optimized and so, but yeah, you can do things like this. And let me just show you when you have something like that, you know, you have a lot of room to kind of, this is shot flat, but this one is a, is a uh, transcode, you know? So I, I still have quite a bit of room here, you know, to, to adjust. And I can adjust that saturation, but you know, the ideal situation, and you know, I can even go in and add LUTs you know, just in case you want to add a LUT to it, you know, so, but, you know, again, see that 709, you don't have as much wiggle room. So, or actually this is log, but I've already done this. Uh, I've already adjusted, but yeah, here's your LUTs on, on 709. That's just a pro res. So, uh, by the way, just to tip a hat to 422, 420, all right, 10-bit, see this down here? 10-bit is the key. You don't want to be shooting 8-bit, uh, even if it's like, uh, I know one camera, uh, particular, the Panasonic EVA1 shoots 4K, shoots all this stuff. And then when you start picking your flavors of 4K, you might you won't notice, but it'll give you a more compressed 4K, but it's 8-bit. <clears throat> and you might not be able to tell by the naked eye with great lighting and 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 a good background you can't tell but you will tell uh when it comes to the finer detail so like if you see hey i can get 4k at 8 bit but i can get 10 bit uh 1080 i'll take a 10 bit 1080 that i size up 
4K, that's a lot better to me than the 8-bit 4K. 8-bit 4K is not the same. So, so um, yeah, the, the, you know, the details matter. And, um, you know, personally, if you can get 10-bit and that's a better pixel, right, then, you know, I, I would go with 10-bit, like, period. So forget 4K. If you got a great 1080, work with that. Um, and, you know, the ideal situation is um, that you get the option to size up later and you have a really nice, crisp image that came from 10-bit, not 8-bit. 8-bit stuff starts to fall apart. It easily dissolves. It's like the paper straw that you leave in your drink versus the composite, you know, good for the environment straw, you know. But 10-bit uh, is where it's at. Uh, don't shoot 8-bit if you care about your color. If you have to because it's a drone shot and you don't have the one that does the 10-bit, that's fine too. But just to, just to you know, double down on that, again, artistic shots, these are the ones you want to save your memory card for. Um, you know, get in the artistic shot that you can now uh, adjust, right? And you can go and you can uh, shoot it in RAW and then adjust your uh, your image, you know. So this one's not in RAW. This is a, my ProRes, but you get the idea. So um, if there are questions, I'll leave it up for a little bit of questions. And then Max, if you want to chime in and maybe uh, refresh on anything before I hop off here. Well, thank you very much, Tony. Um, you answered all the questions. And yeah, it's such a great, great analogy. Thank you so much. And I believe some of this footage is actually available already, right? On older uh, stuff that we've done. I feel okay. like I've this. So if you wanted to, uh, I think on that on our YouTube page, you can find. Yeah. It. Um, on on that note, then I can make the footage available. I'll I'll search for that footage and I will upload it in um in the in the Dropbox. So yeah, um, you, you guys can play around with the footage as well. I think it's already Sorry? on the Dropbox. That's on one of the links. Yeah, but probably in the in the older yeah. webinar. But yes. I'll I'll dig into it and find it and update it the Dropbox. Sure. And uh, you know, with with that all said, you know, I'm sure Max is gonna he'll be talking about noise and uh, you know noise and compression, noise yes. ratio, uh, and that's there's when sizing things up just to tip a hat to noise. Uh, you know, when you're doing the scaling, there's also you're doing a balancing act of sharpness right which kicks up dust dust being the noise right and then uh you know softness do you want sharp do you want soft and uh do you need uh if you need detail with detail comes noise that gets kicked up and compression and stuff like that so i'm sure uh, max can tell you a lot about that but uh, this we'll thing, touch about uh, the noise reductions method um, in both in Resolve and also in Premiere Pro if you are using Premiere Pro. Um, but there's a um, interesting questions from Marissa. Um, have you ever have any experience upscaling SD footage from and uh, SD footage that needs upscaling and digitized from Betacam a uh, Betacam uh, tape, for example? Yes, yes, I have. Uh, what is your approach on that? So you can, there are, um, um, and it depends, it might not pop up. I think it knows uh, ahead of time, but there is a de-interlacing function inside of built into Resolve. There's de-interlacing in Premiere as well, but there's a de-interlacing function that will pop up inside clip attributes. Um, so there's also third party effects and filters and uh, there's a red giant one, I believe too, but there's also just built right into Resolve. I think it's in 17. No, it was in 16, I want to say. Um, and it's a free option that basically inside of here, you can choose how you'd like to de-interlace. I do it quite a bit with, uh, you know, when you get stock from any of the stock websites, if it's something that's like, uh, you know, a, like wartime footage or something that was a news report from the 70s or, you know, the 80s or, you know, any of this, well, beta cam, sorry, but, uh, so we're talking 80s, 90s, you know, maybe um, some, some, uh, all that old tape stuff, which looks awesome. Now people try to emulate it and you can actually get the effects. Red Giant has a whole set of effects to make that look. So maybe you either A, you want to clean it up or B, 
you want to dirty up the rest of what you have to look like that. Just kidding. Aesthetic um, choice. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, but the option will be in here in clip attributes, and you'll see a dinner D, a D interlace uh, feature, and just know that that will also give you stuttery playback because that is a process. So I highly recommend if you do the method in here and depending on your computer, you can right click. You can do this in Premiere as well. Render in place in Premiere, it's called um, render and replace. This is render in place. The other one is render and replace. And you can make it a ProRes or whatever file you'd like to make it. But uh, the option's built in and it does a pretty good job and uh, you know, at that point, sometimes I think softening things um, and losing a little bit of detail is is my preferred method. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much, Tony. Mm -hmm. So yeah, do we want to switch to my um, part now? Yeah, and then uh, I'll drop. I guess I'll drop in the chat if anybody wants to connect. Um, I can. I'll provide my. You can ask questions I'll, I'll i'll provide my linkedin and uh feel free to reach out yeah thank you very much tony right. and um by the way if you have any questions feel free to send your questions to uh training at maxon.net we'll be happy to answer your questions all right thanks a lot max thanks everyone thank you so much tony uh take care so i'll all take right. it from here all right enjoy the rest of your thursday or, or thank you friday for wherever you're at. <laughs> Thank you okay. so much. So um, let me share my screen um, and let me rearrange uh, my view a little bit. So I hope everyone can see my screen. Um, in today's occasions, we will talk a little bit more about how we process uh, the node inside Resolve. What is the node order and how do you tackle the, the, the order of processing? How do you understand the proce uh, order of processing? So order of, process uh, of, pro uh, order of operations, sorry for the hiccups. Order of operations is really important and um, it doesn't differ much if you already familiar with a layer-based um, um, software, for example. You know that in layer-based, um, the adjustment normally um, applied from the topmost of the layer and it will be passed on to the lower layer. But in the node environment, in the node-based environment, it, it is different, but it's not that much different. So, um, the node, each of the node is capable of reusing information from the previous node. So whatever you are introducing in the first node, those informations will be passed on and inherited to the second node that comes afterward. So our purpose of doing the post-production um, work is always the same, be it in the layer-based or in the node-based. We want to achieve great looking image while retaining all the quality. It means that we want to have the least possible amount of image degradations. So let us jump into Resolve to see that. Well, this is Premiere Pro and this should be Resolve. Let me minimize my GoToWebinar interface and we should be back. So can everyone see my screen fine? I hope. Everyone can see my screen fine. And here in Resolve, what I want to show you is that um, where do you put your corrections will affect your corrections heavily. So for example, this is the timeline that we shared uh, last week uh, with the sessions with Diego. And you can still access this timeline and footage in the Dropbox links. And we already talked a little bit more about the image normalizations and image balancing in the previous note. Uh, in, in a preference pre uh, sessions and just for uh, to, just to refresh our um, our sessions what we did back then is that uh, to normalize an image let me just reset everything reset all grades and notes or by pressing control home so what we did is that we want to preview our log um, image in our display 
uh, color space. And in this case, I'm using a uh, Rec. 709 display. So I want to massage the RGB pixels on the image to fit into my color space, my display color space. And I can do that manually by adjusting the contrast level of the image, the saturations and everything. Or there is a easier way to do that. That is by using some sort of color management. And in this case, we can use LUT to convert our image from log color space into more uh, display color space, Rec. 709. And I know that this was shot with Blackmagic Design. So I'll go to Blackmagic LUT and use the Gen 5 film to extend the video. And then also, I establish a note before the color space conversions by pressing Control S. And here I do, I, I do the image balancing either by adjusting the contrast of the image and by adjusting the exposure, I mean, and then adjusting the contrast by uh, toning down the shadow area and also do the auto white balance adjustment in this case. So I pretty much like it like this, but what I want to show you now um, is that where do you need to do your uh, corrections and how your corrections will affect the order of processing. So we can uh, forget about these two notes a little bit, and then we will work before the LUT. So I will create another node by pressing Control S to create a node before this corrector node. And here, let us say that probably we want to establish a look onto, uh, for, for this image. And probably we want to create a sepia tone on this image. We know that sepia tone is a black and white image with a sepia tinge on top of that, right? So we can try to convert our image from the output signal over here, the source signal, and we can try to convert that to a black and white image first. There are two ways to convert. Uh, there are some ways, not just one way, to convert your image into black and white. First, you can do the saturations approach by reducing the saturation to zero. Uh, theoretically, you have black and white image. Or in Resolve, there's another tool that you can use for that, and that is the RGB mixer. RGB mixer allows you to convert the image into a um, monochromatic image by using this checkbox while still having the control over the red, green, and blue channel. So for example, if you are familiar with uh, black and white photography back in the day, uh, sometimes you put, um, how do you call it, the color filter, red filter in front of your lens. And when you shoot landscape, you will be able to darken the sky by using the red filter, for example. So we can mimic similar stuff like that by playing around with the RGB channel over here. So I like this level of contrast, for example. And now we want to create a sepia tone um, on, on this image. Let me rename the node. You can rename the node by uh, right-clicking it and select node channel. And let's say about black and white. And we can create another node by right-click, add node, add serial. And here we'll name it as sepia. So we know that sepia tone image is a sepia tinge on top of the black and white image, right? So let's go to our primary wheels and we can either play around with the temperature or just the gain control in our primary wheels. So now what you can see is a heavy sepia tone on top of the black and white image. We successfully create the black, uh, the sepia tone image. But um, the things that you need to notice is that by going to the first node and change the each channel over here, you can still manipulate the contrast of the image and the image remain as a sepia image. But for example, if I'm going to bypass the second node, I detach the node and then uh, put the sepia node in front of the black and white node, you see what happened. So theoretically, it's a really different approach. What you see is um, the image got an orange tinge and then it is turned into 
a monochromatic image, right? So it's totally a different. So it's totally a different um, um, order of operations. You really need to know what is your objective. And I hope that this example shows you that the you need to put thought about what corrections should you use and in which node order that you need to use that corrections. And simply understand that the succeeding node, the second node, always carry information from the first node. Right? So that is a simple uh, note about node order. And let us delete that. And what I want to show you again is that another um, interesting stuff about node, about corrector node, is that corrector node. So, for example, if I'm creating corrector node, at node, at corrector, there's an interesting case about uh, corrector node. Any corrector node can only accept one input. So, for example, let me connect this. It can only accept one input but it can output multiple RGB outputs. So for example, if I'm creating another corrector nodes here and there and one more. So if you see, if I'm trying to, uh, how do you call it? Output my RGB signal from node number one to node number two, I can do so. But the thing is, they are only accepting one input. So for example, if I'm trying my node number one into node number two, and then I try to connect node number three into node number two, it will bypass the input, right? So simply understand that um, corrector nodes can only take uh, one input, but it can, um, how do you call it? Uh, send out multiple output. But here is the interesting case. If you have this type of situations, how do you blend in then? How do you blend this, uh, this three nodes? Well, in Resolve, there, is, there are two, um, is my screen frozen by the way, guys? Oh, sorry about that. Let me check. Let me troubleshoot this one. Can you see my screen? So for example, if I'm deleting node number four, can you see it real time updating? Oh, what is wrong here? All right, um, let me stop my screen sharing and I, I will reshare my screen again, okay? Bear with me. Oh, probably my connections. So can you all see my screen now? Um, well, I think I will just continue. And then if the connections problem is not solved, um, I hope that you can uh, follow along with the recording of the webinar. Um, the recording will be uploaded to YouTube right after the sessions, all right? I'm sorry for the, for the inconvenience. So let me go back again about, um, uh, about mixing all the nodes available, uh, all the three, um, how do you call it, the corrector nodes. What are the possibility to mix corrector nodes inside Resolve? Well, in Resolve, there are two ways that you can uh, mix um, corrector node. And those two ways are by using the mixer nodes. 
and you have two types of mixer nodes inside Resolve. And that is the parallel mixer or the layer mixer. Now, what is the difference? What is the difference between parallel mixer and layer mixer? Why do I need both? Right, let me show you that. So let us connect our nodes into parallel mixer nodes. And in parallel mixer or layer mixer, you can also add node input, right? And I will output it there. So here, for example, if I'm going to create a power window with no softening in the first node, and on the second node, another power window, and the third node, another power window, another same power window. So we'll go back to node number two, and we'll push red to four. Yeah, we have a bright red in the node number two. And node number three, we'll push four in green channel. And in the node number four, we'll push blue to four. Same value. So what did you notice? If I am uh, switching off the node number three, we only see the red, right? As I am mixing green, we have yellow. And as I'm mixing blue, we have neutral. So parallel node, it blends equally. So it takes all your nodes, all your corrector nodes that you stack and it blends them equally. So um, let us separate this so we can see that more clearly. And as you can see, R, G, B mixed together, you got neutral color, right? And what is the difference between layer uh, mixer? Um, in this case, you can create layer mixer, or you can also morph the parallel mixer that we have, and we can morph it into layer mixer. Now, as you can see in the layer mixer, it doesn't blend equally, but in layer mixer, it's same like in um, layer-based um, software. You have composite mode, or what we call in Resolve, the uh, composite mode, or in another software may be called the blend mode, right? So you have all the multiply, overlay, hard light, soft light, anything. But here is the interesting that you need to understand in layer mixer node. In layer mixer node inside Resolve, the node at the bottom has the most priority. So it will be showed like on the top of the other node. So for example, if I'm going to, um, remap red into the third output and blue on the first output, you see that the red is right on top. Okay. So layer mixer, the bottom most has the most, has the top priority. So that is the node order in resolve. And in this occasions, I would like to talk to you about magic bullet suite. Because in Magic Bullet Suite, you're probably already familiar with Magic Bullet Suite. It's the tools that we use a lot and it's very easy to use. But because it's very easy to use, sometimes you sometimes you didn't realize that probably you use it not optimal, right? I don't want to say wrong because there's no wrong um, in, in, in this. Um, there are tools inside Magic Bullet Suite that is actually... Um, actually were created, were made in order for you to use it in a very fast turnaround project. So all these tools, that is Colorista, Film and Mojo, it will take any clip that you throw at them, either a blog or video or flat video, and it will just output it as a video, in this case, sRGB level. So. Um, since Colorista is not running in Resolve, um, I would like to point you out to, uh, to Film and Mojo. Film and Mojo can create look in an instant, and you can uh, get a really nice look in an instant. But the thing that you really need to bear in mind, they will turn your um, signal level into video signal. So always to to, to how do you call it, to to get the better the the most out of the tools. It is always better if you use these two tools, Film and Mojo, at the end of your chain. So for example, let us jump into Resolve. And let's switch timeline, by the way. Um, 
this footage, this one, the first footage over here is the footage that is provided by Ari. And if you go to the PDF um, handout that I put it in the handout sections, there is a link that you can follow to download this footage. So you can download the same footage from Ari um, website. So what I want to show you is that, for example, if we have lot, in this case, it's Ari, a conversion lot, and you want to work with Mojo, let me create another node after the lot, you know, you have the opportunity to work, to, to set the, the tool, to tell the tool that, hey, I am now working with video level signal because you have a LUT prior to that. And this LUT is turning your signal into video signal. But you can also work before the conversion LUT. But in this case, you will not be able to work with a conversion LUT here because this conversion LUT is turning log C to rec 709. Meanwhile, your mojo here, it's outputting into video signal. So this is probably the most uh, misunderstood um, way to use uh, mojo in film. Um, it is better to use them right at the end of the chain of your process. And in this case, I can just delete my LUT and we'll start from there. For example, if I, Mojo is really good for you if you want to create um, uh, a look which uh, built upon the col complementary color concept. So what Mojo is doing under the hood is actually it takes all your uh, shadow area and push it to the cooler tone. And then it takes your highlight area and push it to the warm tone. So if you know it's that teal and orange kind of vibe. So when you're using Mojo, we know that the, the tool is outputting into a uh, video color space. When you're using Mojo, it is always best to tell Mojo what type of uh, footage that you use. And in this case, you have four um, different options. And since this, this is a log file that comes from uh, Alexa, so I will just choose Log Pro to have like the highest contrast level. And from now on, I can tackle the exposure, for example, and probably reduce the contrast a little bit by use the, using the punch it level here, slider, and probably squeeze the blue, harmonize the blue, and then play around with the tint, right? So that is how you use it, how you use Mojo. Use it right at the end of the chain. Similar with film. With Magic Bullet film, you also need to do the similar thing. Use it right at the end of the, of the chain. And you need to inform um, film that you're working with log space, with the log fi uh, clip. And you can play around with the exposure and you can select the negative and then the print stock respectively. Now, here is the thing. This is nice that you can emulate film, but what if you want to ins uh, insert any process in between, between the, film negative, and also the print uh, film. Or if you want to use Mojo, but you still want to output your um, footage into the same lock, uh, how do you call it, signal level. Well, in that case, if you want to use this um, two tools in a more sophisticated way and um, retaining your lock signal, you can use them inside Magic Bullet Looks. Magic Bullet Looks is a, is, a, is a, how do you call it, the flagship tools from Red Giant, Maxon, and it allows you to, um, to have multiple um, gamma input, and then also, you can also output it into um, many multiple gamma. So let me show you that. So we'll drop Magic Bullet Looks into this node, and we'll have Magic Bullet Look running. Magic Bullet Look has its own interface. So it's also running in Premiere. It's also running in um, Media Composer and Final Cut as well. So whenever, wherever you are working with Magic Bullet Looks, it always looks the same. So the idea of Magic Bullet Looks 
It comes with over 300 presets. If you like to work with presets, you can do so. Uh, but in this example, I will not show you a preset. Now, the things that you need to understand about Magic Bullet Looks is that it is working in a linear color space, in a linear floating point. It provides you with the most flexibility. To, to work in Magic Bullet Looks, you need to inform Magic Bullet Looks what type of footage that you are dealing with. And in this case, I can say that my input is Alexa V3 Log C. And I can choose that and I, and I can select the output as Rec 709 if I want to output it in the video signal, or I can select back Alexa Log C. Or for example, if this Alexa Log C is just one clip of, um, among red clip, and if you want to convert the gamma into red gamma, and you can also convert this by selecting the uh, red, white gamma log 3G10 here. But I will not do that. In this case, I can just use the same um, output gamma, like the input. Or you can also select same as input. Now, the image is pretty desaturated, right? So if you want to preview it in a normal contrast level, normal display level, and you can turn that uh, preview in sRGB uh, button over here. And now you can preview your image in the display level. But the thing is like, it's not applying this sRGB um, contrast because it's still outputting same as input, in this case, log C. And if I am going to accept this, you can still see it's still flat. It's still in the log space. So for example, if I want to emulate film, you can use Magic Bullet Film inside Magic Bullet Looks. And what's nice is it is now split into two different um, film tools. And you can select the film negative and you can also select the film positive. Now, in film print, you can start to play around with the exposure level, something like that. What I want to show you here is that you can, um, how do you call it? insert any type of corrections between the process or before or after. So for example, if I want to just insert Mojo between my film negative and my film print, I can do so now. And in Mojo, probably I will just reduce it to just very little amount of Mojo and reduce the strength as well. So now I can effectively use both tools and then still outputting it back to lock space. And what's nice is also you can uh, use all this uh, in camera effects. The tools are uh, divided into four different categories, selective, camera, color, and film. Selective tools are those tools that you normally uh, found on sets, like the lightings and everything. As you can see, fade light, spotlight, spot exposure, and camera. Think of the in-camera effects, filters. And color corrections are those effects that you need your computer to um, to do. And then the film, like the name said, it's the, the film emulations. So you can use the film negative or film print, or you can also mimic the telecine net uh, conversions film, how do you call it, film, conver film conversions, um, how do you call it, process. And you can just simply drop that at the end. And as you see, as I'm dropping that, I am softening all my shadow. Right, and I can also use the diffusions right at the beginning, and maybe select that. And as I am, um, how do you call it? Accepting this, confirming this, I am now back in my uh, in in Resolve, still in the lock space, but um, still in the lock space. But the the grade is already in the image. Means that later on in the chain, if you want to do something before that. If you have any, um, how do you call it? Anything that you want to do, you can still do so. And at the end of the chain, if you want to use a LUT to convert the color space, you can also do so, right? But instead of doing that, you can also do that inside Magic Bullet Looks as well. If you just want to output it into uh, Rec 709, for example. So that's a little bit of, um, example in Magic Bullet Looks, what do you need to understand is that 
in Magic Bullet Looks and Resolve, they share some common uh, similar properties. The it, you can understand the tool chain inside Magic Bullet Looks as a serial corrector node without parallel mixer or layer mixer, and they are all processed from left to right. As you can see in the example, this uh, compositions of tools inside Magic Bullet Looks is similar to what you see inside Resolve. Um, if you set two transform nodes before and after, and then after that you do your color corrections in between, right? So that is Magic Bullet Looks, and I hope we can move on into noise reductions. Is there any questions before we move into noise reductions? All righty, seems like there's no questions, all good. Now let us talk about noise uh, reductions inside, my, uh, inside uh, DaVinci Resolve. But before we talk about uh, noise reductions, what I want you to understand is that image has components, right? There are components of image. And the image that we see in our computer screen consists of two different components, the Luma channel and then the Chroma channel. The Luma channel carries the, the how do you call it, the luminance of the signal. Meanwhile, the Chroma channel, it carries the color information of the signal. And then added together, they will form an image that you see in your screen. And if you are familiar with the old uh, CRT tube televisions, you probably see stuff like this, right? In that old uh, televisions, it's actually a very good example. You have like this YCBCR or, or YPBPR uh, cable plugs. As you are plugging the Y cable, you have your image, but it is black and white. And as you are plugging the CB and CR cable, you start to have a colored image, right? So that is the two different components of image. And actually our colored television is actually a colored television because it's a color su superimposed on a, on a black and white image, right? So um, when we are tackling noise reductions, sometimes, these are the common dilemmas that we uh, normally face when we are talking about uh, noise reductions. What is the good starting point? From where do I start? And how much of noise reductions that we need to apply? Or even where to use the noise reductions in the pipeline before or after any other corrections? Now, we'll see that inside Resolve. Hopefully, I can uh, help you to understand some of the, uh, give you a nice explanations about noise reductions. So let me reset everything and reset all grades and notes, close my open effects. And here, let us put the normal preview LUT that we have, uh, conversion LUT that we have, Array Log C to Rec 709. So um, why do we need to understand that image has two components? That's actually um, really helpful because sometimes noise can also only live in either of this channel. They can only either live in the uh, Luma channel or in the Chroma channel. So by, by knowing this, hopefully you, you, you understand that you don't need to apply uh, noise corrections like in every channel and then just, you know, apply it randomly. By applying it selectively, uh, applying it selectively, you'll be able to save resources. Right, so let us simulate that actually how that the, the images consist of two different channels. So for example, let me create another node and I will port this into this one and that one and create a layer mixer. Okay. Now let's name this one as our Luma. And let's name this one as our Chroma channel. So what is Luma channel? Luma channel, we know that is just the luminance without the color, right? So what we can do here, we can try to remove all the color by using the saturations and push it to zero. 
And as you can see, there's nothing uh, happened in the uh, preview, but that is because we are using layer mixer and the bottom node has the most important uh, importance, has the most priority. So if I'm deactivating my second node, you can see that we successfully turned the image into black and white by reducing the saturations, right? And then let's mimic the, let's mimic the chroma channel, the chroma um, signal. What is, what, what's happening in the chroma channel? Those signals in the chroma channel are basically just the color, right? Without the luminance. And if we are going to see our primary wheels, and if we check our lift, gamma, and gain, the one that has values are only the gain. And if you can see, there are YRGB channel. And in this case, the Y stands for, for the luminance, and we can just reduce that. Now we successfully, um, how do you call it, mimic that. But why is my preview black? Because you need to change the composite mode into add. And if we deactivate this, you should see no difference at all, because we're just literally mimicking what happening with the image components, right? So. As I, can, uh, as I said previously, um, knowing this will be very helpful for you because this will allow you to understand that noise can sometimes only happen in the Luma channel, but can, it can also happen in Chroma channel or in both, right? So for example, if we try to zoom in and if I'm act activating my, um, how do you call it, the highlight mode, can you see the noise, right? I think we all can see that there is noise in the Luma channel. Meanwhile, if we're going back into our Chroma channel, there's hardly any visible noise, right? So what we can understand here is that we have a lot of Luma noise, but not color noise, right? So let me go back to fit and then let us delete this. So let me create a node to apply our node, uh, noise reductions. So another note about uh, noise reductions inside Resolve is that noise reductions only come with the studio versions. So for all of you who doesn't have studio versions, maybe you can um, take this as a, as a probably as something that can change your mind to upgrade to studio versions because the noise reductions algorithm is really awesome, all right? And yeah, let us um, apply noise. Sometimes when we are applying noise inside Resolve, it's coming back to the common dilemma again, right? We don't know where is the good starting point. And we just do it willy-nilly, do it like change the frame, change it faster, do it like that and this and so on and so forth. And you see the difference before and after, right? Is that wrong? Well, to be honest, there's nothing wrong really. But what if I told you that there is a more refined way to do noise reductions? And that more refined way is that by using the help of your preview window, and that is by activating the highlight and set it to highlight difference mode. So what you see here is that the highlight, highlight difference will be showing the difference uh, of an adjustment that you're making. And for example, if I'm just cranking it up, you can start to see the pattern inside the, the preview window, right? So all this pattern that you see here are the noise that we remove inside um, using the temporal NR. And if we deactivate the highlight, you can really see before and after, right? So here's the thing. When you are using highlight um, difference mode, the, the important thing that you need to know when you are doing a noise reductions is that as you are seeing the detail of your image, the outline of your image, it means that you are starting to removing detail instead of noise. And we don't want that. We want to retain as much as detail 
as possible, right? So whenever you see your image outline, you can try to back it up. Your adjustment. All right. Now let's move into the second image and let us understand all these different parameters inside uh, noise reductions. Um, if you want to understand uh, the, the, the difference between temporal and spatial in R, well, by the way, there are two different algorithm inside uh, resolve noise reductions. Th there is a temporal in R and there is a spatial in R. To understand an R, um, the temporal in R, simply understand that um, temporal in R is very sensitive to motions. So it doesn't want to remove uh, motions because it will, um, how do you call it? It will understand motions as detail. So the frames, so let me, let me just um, switch on the highlight difference. The frames tells you how many number of frames that resolve or the temporal noise in R should average, should process, okay? So the, the, the algorithm will analyze this amount of frames and then look for the detail, try to separate the detail from the noise. And you can choose between zero to five and zero means there's no uh, frame averaging and higher values apply more frame averaging. But here is the catch. When you're doing high, higher frames when, and when you have fast moving objects inside your clip, it may generate artifacts. So the number of frames, it's coming back again to your experimentations. What I really found is that two always worked for me between two and three, unless I know that there's no motion at all, then I can select a higher number. And below that, we have the motion estimation type. And the motion estimation type is really how Resolve detect motions in the image. This is the method where you tell uh, Resolve, um, where Resolve estimates the amount of motions inside the clip, right? And the default is faster. It is less processor intensive, but also it's less accurate. And then the second one is better. It is more accurate, but it's heavier. And then what's interesting here, it's none. By setting it to none, it's basically you telling temporal NR that, hey, there is no motions, just do your business. It means that it will apply NR like crazy, like, like that because you tell that there's no motions, just apply your thing, right? So I normally set with better. And then now we have the motion range. And motion range let you set the speed of motion that the motion estimations expects to exclude. If you select small, means that resolve will assume that there are only slow moving subject. M meanwhile, if you select too large, means that there are fast moving subjects in the, in the clip and the temporal NR needs to be more careful in that. The better middle ground is medium. And now we have this two sliders, three in fact, inside temporal threshold. That is the luma and chroma and motions. So I hope by understanding the analogy, uh, the, the example that we uh, did together before that image has two components, you can already understand what Luma and Chroma uh, sliders do. So Luma is just basically how much noise reductions will apply in the Luma component of the image. And Chroma is just basically the same thing, but only in the Chroma component of the image. Now, about motion sliders here in temporal threshold, let me show you uh, an example. So, I like to understand the motion uh, threshold slider as the motion itself. If you go to the left, it means that there's no motions and the value on the right means like there are a lot of motions, right? And the default, it is set to 50. It means that the value beyond 50 will be assumed as motions. And therefore, this area will be excluded from the temporal uh, noise reduction treatment. 
and the value below zero, you literally tells uh, temporal NR that there's no motions, you can apply the noise reductions in this area. So if you set it to zero, mean that these are motions and don't apply noise reductions. And if you apply it to zero, uh, 100, means that apply your noise reductions aggressively. So for example, if we are going to apply our noise reductions here, as you can see, as I'm cranking up the Luma and Chroma slider, we start to see the changes in the preview window. If I'm going to set the sliders into 100, it means that everything there is no motion, just apply everything. And if I'm applying it to zero, means that everything is motions. Don't apply your NR. So that is the motion slider. Let me just park it in around 65 because as we see, there's not so much of uh, motions in the image, right? So that is the temporal NR. My idea, uh, my understanding of this noise reduction is always to use temporal noise reductions first and then spatial noise reductions second. Um, my understanding is that spatial noise reductions is there to fine tune the temporal noise reductions. It will try to remove the noise that temporal NR may have missed. So if temporal NR are sensitive to motions, spatial NR is not sensitive to motions. So combinations of both will be the winning combinations, right? Now we have mode here. And in mode, you have selections of faster, better, and enhance. Faster literally just means it's a faster algorithm. It's lightweight to your PC or your Mac, and it's fast. This is very good if you just want to use this, spatial, uh, this threshold just in the lower value. But as you crank it up, you'll start to see a lot of artifacts. Better means that you have a better algorithm and this will yield better quality than faster, but it is more processor intensive. And also in better, you cannot separate Luma or Chroma, so it's always ganked. And the next one is enhance. So enhance, do a better job when you are doing a higher value here in the spatial uh, threshold. Luma and Chroma uh, settings, right? So faster, lower value, enhance, higher value, okay? And with enhance, you can also separate stuff, uh, separate the Luma and Chroma channel. And again, we will just remove the noise and don't want to remove the detail. And as we can see the outline, we'll back it up a little bit more. And the blend, both of them, it acts like the opacity slider. So you can blend the effects 100% if they're at zero or the original state of the image when you're putting to 100. So that is the noise reductions inside Resolve. I hope that I can uh, provide you with a better understanding uh, with these explanations. So this is our uh, image before the noise reductions. And this is after the noise reductions. And one more thing, um, one more note for you when you want to uh, remove noise from your image, it is always best to preview your image in the size where you, like how you want it to be previewed. So actually when you are doing pixel peeping like this, sometimes you can do way too much. So always preview it preview your image in the, in, the, in, the, in the normal size where you want to preview it. If you have a reference monitor, that's really great because you can output it full screen. So this is our image before and after. So that is the temporal and spatial NR inside Resolve. Now the question is, um, what if you don't use Resolve and if you only use Premiere Pro? 
And in Premiere Pro, you can try to remove noise by using uh, denoiser plugins, which is part of um, Magic Bullet Suite as well. And denoiser plugin has the, how do you call it? The, the AI behind it that automatically average your frame processing the analysis under the hood without you have the chance to um, control it. So it's literally um, processing your uh, the, the, the clips and then it will offer you what is the best method to, to um, remove the noise. It's actually very simple. It only consists of five uh, sliders and mostly the one that you use to remove noise are these three sliders. It's just reduce noise, smooth color, and preserve detail. So by default, everything is set to 15 and reduce noise is just you, it's just the control for you to reduce the amount of noise in your image. And the smooth colors, again, coming back to Luma and Chroma, it's try to smooth the banding or the noise or macro blocking that you have only in Chroma channel. And like similar to um, spatial noise reductions, because spatial noise reductions always try to preserve the detail, you also have the options to preserve the detail inside Magic Bullet uh, Denoiser. So for example, if you are making your image plasticky and putting too much, but hey, I'm putting it almost full and the image not really degrading, and you can try to preserve the detail by using the preserve detail slider. And on top of that, you also have the possibility to sharpen your image as well under the sharpen. But what I do is that normally I turn it to zero because I don't want to sharpen my image early in the chain. Coming back again, that's normally how I use um, noise reductions at the very beginning of my chains because I want a pure signal before it was affected by any other uh, corrections. And then I will apply my noise reductions first and then do another corrections. And then at the end, when an, the, the corrections that I made introduce another noise, then I can use another noise reductions at the end. But my preference is always to use it at the beginning of the chain. But coming back again to the quote from Robbie Carmen from Mixing Light, Color grading is a part of post-productions and like everything in post-productions, experimentations is key. And on that note, I really hope that you will want to experiment, download the footage, try out the noise reductions parameter and play around and have fun with it. So if there is no any further questions, we will close our sessions and I would like to Thank you so much for your attendance. And let me um, point you out to our YouTube channel. If you want to rewatch the recording versions of this webinar, you can go to our YouTube channel and download and watch the recording there. And it will be under the hands-on with Maxon playlist, right? And don't forget, you can also get your free t-shirt by using the code that I provide in the hands out. And then also, if you want to take the certifications, you can do so by going to maxon.net slash certifications. And don't forget to show up next week, same time, hands on with Maxon, introductions to color grading. And we will have Diego as guest speaker again. And if you have any questions to me about the sessions or to any other our guest uh, speakers, feel free to reach us out to um, training at maxon.net. We'll try our best to answer every single email that comes to the training um, inbox. So thank you very much. And there is a question from Greg. I often use both the noiser tree in After Effects before going to resolve and do a second NR if I have a noisy footage. Oh yeah, that, that's also a possibility. And thank you so much, Greg, for tuning in. Thank you so much, everybody.
And I hope to see you all next week. And until then, have a great day. Bye-bye.